happen to be one of the most fortunate people in the food service industry because of my support system. Uh, Robbie McNeely has been in business, I think he was born in the meat department. Uh, he's been in business for 40 years, retail and food service. Uh, I've been with Beaver Street Fisheries for 10 years. As many of you guys know, we're a seafood company that also happens to have one of the finest meat cutting facilities in the country. Um, you know, in the 10 years, I'll just share one story with you guys because, again, it's not about me. It's about the experts here that are going to, you know, get you guys ready to hit the streets. I sold zero pounds, zero sales in meat in 2016. Zero sales. Robbie was banging my head in, why don't you sell more meat? Why don't you sell more meat? Uh, well, because I don't try to. I mean, that was the real answer. I never tried. I was, in, I was intimidated. And so what happened is I started hitting sin. Quote, 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 quote. I struck out 100 times. Eventually, I got a bite. Well, one year later, it was a million dollars in sales. One year with Reinhardt Street Fork. And that was despite ourselves, because we didn't have a full team actually selling it. So I don't want to get too lofty, but I think we can potentially even double these numbers with a whole group on board. So that's all I've got. The point is, is I, if I can do it, and I'm a seafood guy, if I can do it, any of you guys can do it, because I can promise you, I know very, very little compared to these guys. I just recently got back from the Certified Angus Beef uh, Associates in Meat Training in Wustro, Ohio, and I'm a work in progress. Yeah, I'm, I'm not like these guys yet, but uh, maybe someday. So you guys can take it away, and if you need me to hit a slide or anything, just let me know. Well, I'm Robbie. Uh, like, I, like Ben said, I've been in this for 40 years. Uh, matter of fact, I just passed 40 this past March. Plan to do at least nine more. I hope. Unless, I hit, unless I hit the lottery. If I hit the lottery, it's done. This <laughs> ain't gonna happen because I don't play. But anyway, we we are we are Beaver Street, and you know this one thing we talked about today on the label. We changed our label a little bit. We took Beaver Street Fisheries off of our beef label. There was a reason for that. There was a reason for that. <coughs> because that that just makes it just a little bit harder for you guys to sell. What do you mean a fisheries cut and say? Well, we took that off, and now we just say pack four on our label. We still have our bug, our, our plant numbers on the label, but we took that off, and now it says pack four Reinhardt Tree Fork on your label. Now, if you really want to get cute with this, you get a, a good customer on board, and you want to you want to make them feel good about what they're doing. We can we can design that label to say pack four Silver Star if they're the only one buying that SKU, and your buyer just fell out of his chair going, "Oh my gosh, now you're gonna make me manage it down to that level." But we can do anything you want to as far as the label goes. All right, to, to make this quick and make it good, Robbie, before you step on in with me real quick, I I just realized when Robbie said he was with Beaver Street, there's people in the room here that don't understand the levels of the players that are here, so. Just by way of introduction, you guys all saw and met and talked with uh, Randy Whittemore today. Randy Whittemore is a brand manager with CAB. CAB, the big brand of beef. Then inside that, you have the food distributor, Reinhardt Food Service, obviously, for the employees. And, and that representative today is Ted and, and Brian. Then the supplier to that food service operation, in this instance, is Beaver Street Fisheries, the HF brand, and the CAB brand of meats. Their local representation is United Foods, which is myself, Brett Spivey. Ricky Gibbs is the owner of United Foods. He's with us today, he and his wife, Carol. And in New Orleans, our representative is uh, Cesar Nunez. Um, so we're the face of Beaver Street to Reinhardt and the operators here local. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, don't, I don't like to take a lot of accolades. I'm just going to be guy. Uh, come on. I, I've been there, done that. <laughs> <laughs> all, all you young people who want to get into the meat business, this is part of it. Now, you, you really don't have to do this. Brett's been in the meat business a long time. Randy, has, Randy you got all your digits? How about that on my You got all your digits? Okay, so these, all these folks have got me. The only thing it was, I was faster than all of them. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm mentoring a young man in, the, in Not my meat. those two, next two days. <laughs> <laughs> I'm mentoring a young man in my meat operation right now. He's 23 years old. He wants to be 
the meat guy one day. He wants to run the meat shop. I said, it's in your court to do that. You had that opportunity. I said, the thing you have to do, and remember this young folks in the room, and, and some of you folks, a little older, you got to outwork the person standing beside of you. I have no college education. I started off bagging groceries in a grocery store. Ended up in the corporate office at Winn-Dixie by nothing but sheer hard work and being in the right place at the right time. And I say that to, to make sure that everybody understands there's opportunities in the food service business. Uh, you young folks, I'm, I'm really directing this to you today. There's plenty of opportunities to make a lot of money. I mean, you take somebody like Brett, he makes a million dollars a year. So. <laughs> <laughs> like Forrest Gump, they must have kept that money because I never saw a penny of it. <laughs> Let me tell you just a little bit about our cut shop. In our cut shop, we, I'm going to run you crazy, I'm sorry. In our cut shop, we have over 150 years of experience within 12 people, okay? 150 years of experience in that room. These guys live and breathe meat. They talk about it at home, they talk about it at work, and that's all they talk about is cutting meat. And they're really, really prideful in what they do. If you get a bag cut from Beaver Street, you need to let us know, because we, we have a system in place that we can crack it right back to the meat cutter. Believe it or not, that box, if you give me a picture at the end of that box with the lot number, I can track it back to the guy that stuck the knife in it. And then I can also track it through our QC process, so I'm going to bust about five hides when you send us a picture badge back. So let's... <laughs> A real-world application story. You know, we we can project our future success by looking at how we react to our stone. Um, we have a very large operator here in town that's a prime vendor customer of Reinhardt's that ordered a large batch of tenderloin steaks cut in three sizes. Ordered it, <coughs> we shipped it all down here, put it in the warehouse, and started shipping to this operator. Day three of the operator using it, he's got a problem. He's looking at steaks. Each one's different. They're not consistent. There's something wrong here. Well, that's what we sell is consistency. We, we sell perfection from one item to the next. This is not the way Beaver Street acts. So Brett goes over there, gets the scale out, starts. I'm thinking, this is impossible. There's no way this operator's got to be wrong. Because nine times out of four, when I go check, there's a mistake at the operator end. Not this time. Start weighing steaks. 10 is 10.4, 10.9, 9 9.2, 8s are 9.1, 8.9. So they're giving away meat that they're paying for. I get on the phone with Beaver Street. Here's the first words out of his mouth. Did you check that? Did you do it? Yeah, here's the scale. Here's what I did. Here's pictures of it. Well, box it up and send it all back here. We'll be cut. Took the entire order back to Beaver Street, took the cutters that cut it the first time, brought them in, retrained them, rescaled all of it, opened those packs up, recut every single item, repacked it, rebranded it, shipped it back to Shreveport and into that operator. Perfection, stake after stake after stake. We're talking about thousands of pounds. When he says he can track it back to the meat cutter, He's not just saying that to, so you feel assured. He tracks it back to the meat cutter because that's the guy that came back in Saturday morning at 6 a.m. and recut all those steaks. Okay? There's a level of quality here <coughs> that an expectation and accountability that runs through the entire supply chain here. And that's what you're getting when you're buying into this brand through this supply. We do take it very personal. Thank you for uh, bringing up our cost cut back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for chicks. All right, so, so here's what we're going to do. We're, we're going we're to take a walk through the, through the end. Well, I mean, Randy done a terrific job presenting the brand. And that's what Randy and his group, they do. They sell the brand. They're a marketing group. He said that they do not own a piece of meat. They have never sold a piece of meat. He is correct. But they are, they are the education piece and what helps you sell the product. We actually take ownership of this meat, and we actually cut it, and we actually sell it. So we got a little more ownership in it than what CAB does. But we love CAB, and they are why we're here today. So let's start at the very front, and you can picture this. This I, I love this poster here. You can picture this. If, if he had a head on him, it'd be right here. If he had a, a tail on him, it'd be the other end. Okay, so you kind of get a visual of how how you, he's standing up there. This is only half of him. Okay, this is one half of him. We're going to start right down the animal. This is a brisket. Huge, yeah. huge piece of meat, right? Right here. It's under the, when the cow's standing here like this.
this, is, is if you got your little calf, it's right between his front legs, that brisket. <coughs> and if you guys have your, your program books, you can open to the first page of the program book and you can see the cutout. Now, a good cowboy who's buying cattle can stand and look at one or two of those cattle in a feed pen, and he looks at the brisket, and he can just about tell you whether that thing's going to grade out as choice or CAB or select by the size of that chest on that, on that animal standing in the feedlot. So that's the brisket. <coughs> Everybody knows what a brisket is. You go to barbecue places, everybody loves a brisket, right? It's a big old piece of meat that I love to cook these things. I do a pretty good job with it, okay? Now, right on the top side of the brisket, you got the shank, which is the front leg. We don't have one here because we don't really sell those. But like we said before, as a whole, the industry needs to sell the whole animal. So don't, don't ever pass on any of this. And on top of that is the shoulder, or the chuck, on the very top of the leg. Now what comes out of that, as we got here today, this is the top blade that comes off of the shoulder. Anybody want to guess what comes out of a top blade? Flat iron steak. Flat iron steak. A lot of people call it chicken steak or whatever. But this, this actual steak has been developed for that customer we talked about who needs a little less expensive steak on their menu. I'm not going to call it cheap because it's not. It's good. It, it is a good piece of meat. Me personally, I went further back in the animal. But a lot of people eat the flat iron steak. Okay? Then you got the hanger. <clears throat> the hanger is something that's just kind of taken off here recently. And they call it the hanger for a reason. It hangs inside of the cavity of the animal, okay? It's just a hanging tinder. Back in the day, when, when Brett was working at the meat shop, back in the early 20s, <laughs> we used to take those things. That's why I was hairless last year. That's why I was hairless last year. Take the shot when you can get <laughs> Those hangers were just basically thrown in the ground beef, or the butcher took them home with him, because he knew how good they were. <coughs> hanging tinder steak is great cook medium rare. The longer you cook it, the worse it gets. <laughs> but don't be shy about selling hangers, because that is a good piece of meat. Really good piece of meat. This is not an item you currently have set up in stock <laughs> right now, but every single one of the SCs on the street right now has one to three accounts <clears throat> that would benefit from this stuff. Where they're selling a premium ribeye, they're selling a premium sirloin, and they're talking to you about trying to get a cheap <laughs> piece of meat, on their menu, this gives them a quality piece of meat at a better price point. Steak frites. Anybody ever heard of steak frites? That's what most people make them out of. Now I threw this one in here. And this one I just, I don't really like a flat iron. I deplore a Denver steak, but there's a lot of customers out there that can use a Denver steak. It comes out of the chuck roll. Don't have a chuck roll, but it, it comes out of this piece right here. Not a bad piece of meat. Boneless chuck short ribs. Another thing we can do for you. All right, so that basically took care of the front half of the animal, the front quarter of the animal, okay? Now we get into the good, what I call the good stuff. And now we get into what's called middle meat, okay? And the reason we call them middle meat is because they came from where? In the middle of the cow. And how about that? Let's start at the bottom of the middle. Plate. This is called a short plate. It's a short rib. style ribs. Well, it seems like somebody somewhere had come up with a new cut, which ain't a new cut, but uh, you know how chefs are. <laughs> it's called a brontosaurus rib. And they take and cut between the bones and make big old single ribs. Is there any Tony Romans around? Yeah, Dr. Houston. 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 Best one I've ever eaten. A full bone-in short rib. When it cooks, it'll draw down from that bone and almost like it's got a handlebar on it, okay? Brontosaurus rib, short rib. Common in South Texas barbecue now, uh, Mueller's, Hard Eight, uh, Pecan Lodge, those, those high-end barbecue places in Central and South Texas are always doing a beef rib now. You now have the flanken style, 
short rib in stock at Reinhardt and the four bone uh, short, uh, Chuck short rib. Chuck short rib. Yeah, okay. Okay. There's a difference now, and there's a huge price difference between a Chuck short rib and a rib short rib. You don't get the two mixed up because there is a difference. Chuck short rib, rib short rib. See where it came from? The middle of the cow. What did I tell you about the middle of the cow? Middle of the cow is always more tasty. All right. My favorite piece of meat in the animal, ribeye. This one's actually a bone-in export rib. And there's a reason he's showing you that export. <coughs> and Randy, why do they call it export? Randy? Randy. Sorry. Brent, why they call why they call them exports? That's just a, that's just one of those names that was hung. Um, that piece of meat, it's so, actually a 109 so e. When they started boxing, when they started boxing bone and ribeye, mm -hmm. most of that was exported outside of the United States. That's, That's why it's called export rib. There you go. Randy Jr. just answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> so we have an extremely large buy-in at Beaver Street on export ribs. This is the ideal holiday service item for restaurants that do carving stations when they're selling holiday parties when they're doing a prime rib night. So we have this product in stock right now, currently priced about $2 below the market, which means you are gonna tell your customer it's 50 cents below the market. And you could kill your competition with it, trust me guys. Um, you, you have a really good deal on this product right now mm -hmm. that you can have cut into tomahawk steaks, stop. bone in stop. rib eyes. Stop, stop, stop. Sorry, got to correct you, Paul. <coughs> a tomahawk, which we do have, is the same one, but the bone's about this long. Correct. Now, cowboys and rib steaks, cowboys has a shorter bone. It prints down. No, nothing on. Sorry about that. Oh, that's great. Cowboys, we got a great price on those. Mm -hmm. And a bone-in rib steak, bone-in ribeye, my favorite cut of meat, really good price on those. Okay, so you have customers that have on their menu cowboy ribeye, and very often they're not actually purchasing a cowboy ribeye. A cowboy cut has the entire bone, and it is French down to the spinalis and eye. Okay? That is a cowboy cut ribeye. A bone-in ribeye steak, on the other hand, is cut to a specific thickness and weight without regard to where the bone is. Right. Will you all cut to a customer spec if they want all chuck in ribeyes? We, we want Beaver Street to be the meat room for every one of your customers. You give us you give us a spec and we'll cut to it. That's, that's the beauty of Beaver Street. There's no order too small and there's no order too big. You get a, you get a customer with a spec. I know Chris, you're sitting there going, got another coach set up. Uh, I was going to say the primal hawk comes out from one of those three. Yeah, it comes off a 103 rib. This is a 109 E rib. You're right, but it is, it, it, if it wasn't trimmed down to 109, it started as a 103. Then you cut that tail off, you cut that bone off, you end up with a 109. Very good. Do you guys know what these numbers are that are being thrown around? Okay. They come from the National Association of Meat Producers, or NAMPI. The NAMPI Meat Buyer's Guide is the Bible of all meat cutting. There's one on the top of that trash can. Back I've got one right here. Um, I don't. I don't leave the house for a sales day without these. I carry it around all the time because invariably you have a customer that not only you don't know what he knows, what he needs, he doesn't know what he needs. But when you can open up a book and have him point at a picture and say, "That's what I want." Then I know exactly what you want. And then you can send an email that says, I want a 1710. There's no room for doubt. There's no wiggle room for what he's going to get. You now, every one of your Beaver Street codes that are set up in the description line has a NAMPI number. If it says it's a 189, then you can open up a meat buyer's guide and look at the picture, and that's what it's going to be. If it says it's a 1190, when it has that extra one in it, it's cut steak instead of a subprimal, then you can open up that meat buyer's guide and look at a picture, and that's what it's going to be. That's, that's the best thing that anybody ever came up with. We live and die by that book. 
You can order one of these for yourself off Amazon for about 70 bucks. Um, well, what I'm going to follow up with that is you can get an older version mm -hmm. for a lot less if you... You, you can buy them used off Amazon from 17 to 22 The best money you'll ever spend. I'm serious. It is. If you, if you want to sell sex. And I think everybody in here wants to sell sex. Now, right, now let's move on down the animal a little bit. Also, in your CAB app, they have it all in there as well. Bingo. And you use your CAB app. You don't even have Which to is free. Which is free. Before we leave the rib primal here, this flat place on the end of the rib here, when you saw them ribbing the carcass to take that photo and grade the steak, this is what they're looking at right here. This is what they're looking at right here. That's why he's here. I'm glad that's another piece going to chuck. The difference between the chuck eye steak and the first set of the rib eye steak is what? The width of the saw blade. That close. Alright, you move down to the animal where they rivet, like a frog, it hooks up to the T-bone, the store one. Okay, the difference between that last cut on the ribeye and that first cut on the T-bone is the length of the saw blade. That, that's from here to here, it's just one slide. It goes from ribeye to a short one, between the ribs, that's where it starts. Short one's a good piece of meat. I love good, a good porterhouse, okay? Porterhouse. What's the difference between? Can anybody? Here, here's a good one. Can anybody tell me the difference between a porterhouse and a ribeye, or a porterhouse and a t-bone? One has a fillet, one has a wrong. The size of the fillet. The size of the fillet. Ding ding ding. Got a winner. Right. The our spec is the next spec. What was that? Point, it can go down to a point seven five from the bone. To the bottom of the flank can go down to a 0.75 on a T-bone. On a T-bone, it can go down to 0.75 on the fillet side. Three quarters of an inch right. of fillet. If you want to know how much an inch is, the first joint on your index finger is an inch. You want to measure? Check me out. <laughs> Pretty doggone close on everybody. Okay. Porterhouse. Porterhouse has a bigger fillet. But the thing you run into on the porterhouse. Everybody knows what a New York strip is, right? Yeah. Top part of the porterhouse. <clears throat> How many of you ever eat what's called a vein steak off of a strip? You know what a vein steak is? First cut. It's got that ugly thing that goes through the middle. It's, it's edible, right? And yeah, in the porterhouse, you better hope you get one of the vein steak in it because it's got a bigger fillet. The strip. We cut nothing but center cut strips for you guys. <clears throat> you won't get no vein steak in a strip. If you do, I want to know about it. Pure center cut. That means we cut them further back, okay? Porterhouse, one of my favorite steaks. Cause the, the wife eats the, the filet and I eat the strip. T-bone. We do sell vein steak. That's good for casinos and stuff like that. Yeah, right. Yeah. Less expensive piece of meat is a vein steak. We sell a bunch of them. In cut ribeyes. We got a really good deal on in cut ribeyes. And you say, well, what makes it an in cut ribeye? That fat kernel in ribeye that all the guys like and the ladies hate, that's what makes it an in cut. Nobody wants that kernel of fat looking at it. Well, oh my God, that thing's fatty. Oh boy, that thing's good. <laughs> <laughs> we, those first two ribs off that rib, we put them in the in cuts. And we eat eat that and we sell them cheaper just so we make sure you always get a center cut up when you buy steak from us. Is that what you call star fat? Really? Star fat, kernel fat, very good, very good. Alright, I'm just, like I say, here's your, here's your tenderloin and here's your strip. Tenderloin on one side, strip on the other side. Anybody know what the old timers used to call a tenderloin? You can't answer that question. What was that muscle called? Anybody remember? Backstrap. That's, no. yeah, close. The swimming muscle. How many of you have ever seen a cow swim? Oh, come on. <laughs> Where do you see cows swim? Cows hate to swim, okay? They swimming. The reason they call it the swimming muscle is because it's the most tender muscle in the animal. What makes a, a, a muscle tough? Cow don't 
hardly ever swim. Sometimes they do, obviously, in her neighborhood. <laughs> but very, very seldom. Very, very seldom a cow will swim. That way, that muscle's never used. That makes it more than the most dangerous part of the animal. Okay? Tenderloin steak? Let me tell you about our tenderloin steak. You get a tenderloin steak from us, you get a true center fed tenderloin. Now, we do sell what's called an end to end tenderloin. But one thing you'll never get, you'll never get silver muscle on the outside, you'll never get a chain muscle on our tenderloins. They're always center cut. You order center cut so much, you get a true center cut. So that means you're not going to get a steak that came out of the Chateau Inn with that gnarled uh, grain in it. One of the reasons that chefs like tenderloin so much is because with straight end-to-end -end grain from the top to the bottom of the steak, heat transfers through the steak at an even rate on every single one. So they all cook at the same rate so you get more efficiency in a kitchen. That also means it's easier to overcook. And the closer you get to either end of the tenderloin, the more that grain bends and curls and it makes it harder to cook. All right, so remember now, we're stepping through the cow here. Middle meat, then you come to the, everybody loves the sirloin, except for me. I tell you there's one restaurant I really don't care for. That's the worst. I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to call them out by name, but their initials are OB. Because they sell a lot of sirloins. I'm not a sirloin fan. There's a lot of people who eat sirloins, though. The sirloin we sell is a true center cut sirloin. There's a muscle that goes on top of that. It's called the cap or culotte. You get requests for culotte muscles. You get requests for culotte steaks. We cut some of the best culotte steaks in the world. You want culotte steaks? Give us a hop. We cut. And I, I'll tell you, we don't have a lot of people that are menuing culottes. Right? I, I don't think there's one in North Louisiana right now that I know of menuing a culotte steak. But I'll tell you where it's on every menu. Sandals Resort, uh, Timeline Resort, Secret Resort, all of these all-inclusive resorts with steakhouses in them, they've all got a culotte on the menu. Okay. That comes off the top sirloin? It comes off the top of the top sirloin. It's called the cat muscle. Yeah, I got a meat part of it. How many of you go to a Brazilian steakhouse? You ever been to a Brazilian steakhouse? And I love those things, man. You put that coin over and you eat till you pop and then you flip it back. <laughs> okay? They're using pull-out muscle on those spits that, that they put on there to spin. That's pull-out muscle, what they're using. Now, out of the top sirloin, look at, the, look at these two steaks here. To an untrained eye, look about the same, don't they? How about it? Those, those two steaks look the same to you? Pretty close, right? bacon around it because it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> but a top sirloin is not a bad steak, okay? It's not a tenderloin, but the price difference is about 10 bucks a pound, though. You get price some, difference price dif is about 10 bucks a pound. You get some people to try to fool you and say, well, it's a filet of beef. No, 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 no. Not a filet of beef. Don't get it mixed up. Tenderloin, filet mignon, filet of beef. <laughs> I'm not knocking sirloins. Sell them, man. We love sell sirloins. Nice four ounce sirloins. These are what you're selling as top butt or baseball cut. Yep. Uh, that's as a matter of fact, most of your operators here in this area will refer to them as baseball cut top butt. Why is it called a baseball cut? Why is it called a baseball cut? About the size of a baseball. It's just I mean, guys are simple, man. We're not we're not as fancy as the straw guy. Whoa, what a job that would be, huh? Is he not, is he going to straw that now? How would you like to get up every morning to sell straw? Damn. <laughs> but he also sells, he also sells forks and knives and spoons, so, you know, he's got some variety there. You, you do know all these guys get up every morning and sell straw. Thanks, <laughs> Brett. Except for the ones back there that are buying. Don't, sell, don't stop selling straws because that straw might be your entry into the restaurant that you can sell the real stuff. 
I'm glad this talk I ain't here. I felt so bad for him. Maybe, you know we're talking about no, 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 no. But his, I, I did feel bad for him. I mean, come on. We, we are having exciting ours, ours is walking around. The, the one that you're going to sell next uh, over the next five weeks, he's still walking around out here somewhere. I don't know where the straw is walking around, but it's gone. All right, let's move on down to the, to the back end of the animal, okay? Down to the round. Somebody told me about a salesman. And Brett, don't you call him out. I know how you are. <laughs> and nobody to, else that knows better call him out. No, please don't. Don't point at him. Don't make him stand up. I was trying to sell a beef knuckle from the round as a replacement for a ribeye. <laughs> don't laugh. <laughs> Some of y'all don't know what a knuckle is. The knuckle comes off that back piece. Now, remember what I told you about the muscles, right? The middle muscles don't get much work, so they're more tender. That front one, he's marbled up pretty good, even though he's the front shoulder. He gets some work out, but he, he's got some, some grain in it. Those back legs, those back legs are nothing but pure muscle, okay? That knuckle comes from that back leg. You try to replace a ribeye with a knuckle cut or, or a piece off that round, you'll make that customer happy one time because it's cheap. <coughs> when he serves them and runs off all of his customers, he ain't going to be happy. Now, there is a piece that comes off that round called the eye round. Your chicken fried steak, and, and thank you, by the way, three four division, you have converted us to cutting nothing but cute steak out of the eye round. It was because of you. We tried everything. You know, I grew up in a grocery store. We cut them out of bottom rounds. We cut them out of top rounds. We cut them out of <coughs> knuckles. Finally, y'all convinced me to cut them out of our round. And man, I tell you what, we will not go back. And our round makes the best chicken fried steak, cube steak on earth. Okay? And it has a great yeast. Very good yeast. <coughs> not an expensive piece of meat, but it makes a great cube steak. Okay, so now we're all the way back to the back end of the cow. We don't have an ox sale today. I don't think CAB does ox sales. They stay away from that kind of stuff. They but you do them. have an ox sale in stock. It's been in stock for just a couple of weeks now. We've already moved a couple of cases. Why, why, don't, why don't we do the ox sale? Do you all do a CAB ox sale? Why, somebody answer that question. Why, no, why would we not do that? Nobody's selling ox at this time. Graydon? Graydon is What was that? Graydon? Where, where does, when does that ox sale come off? Within the 30 the minutes. <coughs> within the 30 minutes. The tail is gone. How can you hook it back up? That's right. You won't, you won't find beef cheeks, you won't find tongue, mm -hmm. any of that. No, we'll turn it on Frank. It's all gone before it's ready. So. Yeah, I, I, I left that part off. I want to tell you something. If you've never been to a packing plant, you ever get an opportunity to go, go. That animal walks in, everything on that animal goes out in a box. There's nothing wasted. Even the blood. Even the blood. Okay. The lips. I had a guy send me a quote the other day on ox lips. I, I kid you not, he's told. <laughs> Cheek meat. Tongue. Makes the best tacos. Even I, I was in a plant one day and there was a blue barrel sitting there. And it looked like a bunch of uh, vents <laughs> off of an air conditioner. I said, what in the world is that? It's the esophagus. Ooh. And you all go, Ugh. guess what they're using for? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the, that's the internal stuff. The end of the end, the big jump. <laughs> Use those as pharmaceuticals, believe it or not. Some of the, some of the, I don't know which ones, but it goes to a pharmaceutical plant. Now, how about the bones and the fat and the hair and all that stuff? Where did it go? <laughs> oh, okay, ladies, get ready. Makeup. Makeup. You use lipstick. Yeah, and nobody uses lipstick anymore. Brent, you still use lipstick? Well, he's a kid. <laughs> yeah, he uses lipstick. Yeah, he just went to fresh. He just went to fresh. They use that for lipstick and cosmetics. Have you been there? That stuff with it, rouge or whatever it is on your face? You put no bossy on your face. <laughs> anyway, hey, this, this is really quick. This is just really high level stuff we just went through. 
tell you something, folks. I've been in this business 40 years, and I wouldn't trade it for nothing. You know, I got nine more left. I keep telling people that. This is how I grew up. I've been in this business since I was 12 years old, <coughs> and I, I love it. Like Randy, like Randy says, it has fed my family, it has clothed my family, it has put us in nice houses, and I, I got the best job in the world working for you guys. So if you're not interested in going into something else, guys, the food business is a great business to be in. Because there's one thing about it, everybody's going to eat. If you live on earth, you're going to eat. So there's always going to be money to be made <coughs> buying and selling beef, buying and selling meat, even buying and selling straws. There's money to be made, okay? Uh, just real quick, guys, we're going to be breaking for lunch at, uh, we were supposed to break at 11.30, but the fourth guy went long. So, uh, I'm sorry, it was, it was too easy to tell. Um, we do want to talk about small box versus cut steaks for just a minute. When we first launched this program, the emphasis was on cut steaks. We didn't want you guys to go out into the market without learning how to sell a cut steak program first. Uh, so we sort of shied away from the small box. Well, we're a year into this. We feel like we've got a good foundation of cut steak sales. Um, so we just want to spend a couple minutes on small box, okay? <coughs> small box is cheap program. That means it's I can order a box, you know, typically the short one has three to a box. It's about a 75 pound box. You got a small operator who just refuses to buy cut steaks. And there are some out there that will just say, you know what, I've cut steaks forever and I'm not going to change. Okay, your last resort is to sell them the whole piece. <clears throat> but he's a small operator. He can't afford to buy a 75 pound short one. So if you tell him, say, look, you can buy one at a time if you want to. Ribeyes, one or two to a box. Strips, one or two to a box. Even tenderloins, one, two, three. We even got a six pack now. Usually there's 12 to a box. There's a big business in this small box primal stuff. Your sister division over in Georgia, their number one item is a, is a single pack ribeye. Yeah, you better believe you can. You can, that price goes up expensive. How'd you say that? Exponentially. Exponentially. <laughs> it's small the box. But to an operator who's living week to week, trying to survive, trying to keep that restaurant business going, and who don't have the storage space, who don't have that kind of capital, it's, 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 it's a godsend to them. Single pack primals is a godsend to that operator. Don't leave that money on the table, and don't let your competitor take that from you because they're selling the heck out of it. Your sister division over in Valdosta, or they're just blowing it away with us. I wish they sold as many steaks as y'all did. They sell a lot of steaks, but nowhere near like percentage-wise as y'all do. No. Nothing wrong with taking an idea and capitalizing on it. Randy talked about grind. Grind is a huge opportunity, both patties and soup grind. You won't get fresh grinds from us. We won't take the liability on it. Unless you give me a signed commitment that you're going to buy X amount of pounds every week, then I'll, then I'll handle it for you. What I will do for you, though, frozen ground beef. Close yours, Randy. <coughs> frozen ground beef is good for, if it's, if it's handled right, processed right, it's good for 365 days. We're not going to keep ground beef that long. But that same customer I talked about, buy a single pack primal, we'll buy two rolls of ground beef in a box. And you talk about markup, you talk about profit, you talk about getting the four hundred thousand dollars, four hundred thousand more. <coughs> That's a big opportunity for you. I want you to sell a whole case of ground beef. Randy wants you to sell a whole case of ground beef. Randy wants you to sell a full case of everything, which I do too. But there are a bunch of operators out there you're going to pass on if you don't have a small box program for them. And grind is one that you can take advantage of. And I'm going to tell you something about Beaver Street, folks. You if you come up with it. We'll get it in a box for you. We're, we are very nimble, very quick about turning product around. Very quick. <clears throat> you come up with it, by next Friday, it'll be in a box headed your way. I'm telling you, we're, we're really that good with it. Melissa, do you know where we are on lunch? <clears throat> okay. While well, we're sort of checking on that, I want to just open it up. Uh, surely there's at least, you know, two or three good questions that we could kind of role play with before lunch. 
Does anybody have any uh, sales objection questions? Anything that you wanted to talk about when Randy was up, but it, you kind of, you know, it, it moved on so quickly? Let, let me ask one question. Sure. Let me go first. What's your biggest? Okay, you got some folks here that'll have no problem selling selling steaks. And God love you. Appreciate you. You also have some people sitting in this room going, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, just, I, I'm just afraid, I just don't know what I'm doing. Somebody be a volunteer and tell me, have you ever sold, is there somebody in here who has never sold a box of steak? Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> the Reinhardt Group, thank you folks. Of the Reinhardt Group, what's your biggest stumbling block when it comes to selling steak? Give me, throw something at me. What, what keeps you from being confident about selling the sale? Customer safety, knowledge. Educate on brand. That's brand, knowledge. Well, let me tell you something. <clears throat> You've got a network behind you, me being one of them, Ben being another, your buyer's division, Randy. You've got a network behind you. Guys, pick up the phone. Get, get the customer in front of you. Put a speakerphone. Everybody's got a cell phone. Put them on a speakerphone and call me. They got questions? I'll answer that phone. I'm, I'm, I only work 12 hours a day, so you have to give me another 12 hours. But me, my assistant Javon, Ben, even my meat room manager. If, you, if, if I'm out of town, I go out of the country sometimes selling meat. If you call my office, somebody's going to answer that phone, and we're going to get you an answer, and we'll get on the phone with you right then and there. You line up about eight or ten good customers, I'll make a trip back out here and ride with you. You got to line up some good, make it work, make it worth their while. I'll ride with you. I want to sell steak. I want you to be successful. Don't ever have a stumbling block. Brett's really good about going into customers. Like if you don't know anything, all you have to do is bring them in there, and he just leads the way. Brett is, and then you learn on the way while you're listening to him pitch his sales. Brett is the best, and I'm glad he's not in. He's not in here. Yeah, he's not. He, he is, is the right absolute on. best broker I've ever worked with. Not like I said, I've been this four years. You know, Brett's Brett, but Brett's good. Yep. Brett's, we call him Spike in our office. Because he's there. <laughs> well, there's Spike on the phone. Let's just see what he wants to say. But you want some help? Man, they don't get no better Brett Spike. So, Robbie, so, so one time I went on a, I was on a call and had done the training similar to this, and a salesperson called me up. And she said, Randy, I need some help. I need, I got a customer I want you to come see. Well, I cover like seven states. It's just not that easy for me to go to a customer and see somebody. And so, but she had that whole, what's this, a southern Mississippi, she had that twang. And just, she's like, well, I really, and I'm thinking, man, I feel sorry for her. So where are you at? Well, she told me she's in the middle of nowhere. And I said, where's the customer? And he's right down the road. I said, okay, I said, this, here's what I can do on a Friday. I'll come in and basically had to travel a couple hours out of my way, but I said, you know what, I'll get this knocked out and I'll be off to do it. I don't like things dangling on me. So I went by, and she said, I, I have two customers. And I said, okay. And I said, let's go to the first one. She said, I'll pick you up at the hotel. We'll go see that guy. And I said, okay. So we went there. The conversation ended up going longer than what we thought because he started asking questions come to find out he was an English producer but had a restaurant as well and so he was asking a lot of good questions and she's just sitting there going when we left we were going to the next one and she said can 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 can, can I do this one and then if I fall you pick me up and I said okay I can do that I said you're good she said I think I'm I think I got it. Now she, honest to goodness, she'd heard this twice. When I trained her like this, and then in front of that guy. Now that was very much an open dialogue when we were doing it in front of the first guy. She went to the next one. She missed a little bit, but we got through it. It was no problem. She sold both yeah. of them. The reason I tell you this is because that lady who was a salesperson, within six months, she was the largest selling salesperson of certified Angus beef in that warehouse. They promoted her to district manager. A year later, she was a regional manager. It happened that quick. Here's a, here's a perfect example, Randy. This guy here, fish salesman. There ain't nothing worse than fish salesman. <laughs> <laughs> but now he's a beef, 
Now he's a beef salesman. So he's a straw really. salesman? <laughs> straw salesman. Don't make it worse. <laughs> <laughs> now he, he's our number one. He's our number one beef uh, steak seller, and thanks to you guys. Uh, Brian's giving me the, the finger back there. Do you? <laughs> <laughs> he's doing this now. He's doing this. <laughs> one, one, one last question.
tell you what, uh, please hold these questions because we're going to have a session at the end. We're going to have a good discussion like this. And I do appreciate your attention. I, I know it's been, a, it's been a long morning. We're going to feed you something really good. And what is it, what is it the old guy says? Go Tigers! Go Tigers! Let's go to lunch. 30, 45 minutes. 45 minutes.